and then comes your ASRM Mollerian Anomalies Classification 221, 20, 2021. Why is it important? Because it's latest. Why is it important? Because it is based on so many aspects of, you know, problems that can happen, uh, so many uh, ways in which Mollerian agenesis can manifest. So as you can see, the first column, I just read this thing with you because it's important for us to understand this classification. Baki, everything can be rushed through. And I do want to rush through the other things because this is the thing which is more important for you to remember. The other things you can just learn from, just read from my PPT. <clears throat> now, Mullerian agenesis, what kind of agenesis? It's usually a patchy agenesis. It could be that the, you know, the tubes have not been properly formed. So agenesis of the tube could be agenesis of the uterus could be agenesis of the cervix, but cervical agenesis is taken separately. So right now we're mostly concerned about uterine agenesis. Okay. It's not formed. Uterus has not been formed properly or has not been formed altogether. Just a little bit of, you know, a, you know, a, a horn is there. A very small horn or cavity, cavitated or non-cavitated horn is present. So that is Mullerian agenesis. Then comes cervical agenesis. The uterus is formed you know, kind of rudimentary uh, uterus and fallopian tubes are there, but cervical agenesis is there along with it, the upper vagina is also not formed, right? So cervical agenesis, okay? Could be proximal, could be distal cervical agenesis. Then comes uniconvoid uterus with so many manifestations. It might have another uniconvoid horn. It might have a uniconvoid horn with some cavity in it. That cavity might be communicating. That cavity might not be communicating. Now, remember one thing that a you know, a, a horn with a cavity in it, which is not communicating, is the worst which can happen. Why? Because in that case, the endometrium is going to be a shedding in each menses and will have cyclic pain. So in that case, surgery has to be done. If it's a communicating cavity, she's going to have uh, menses as usual. There is a possibility of, you know, um, implantation in that horn, but it's very, very rare, very rare. Okay, because embryo usually chooses the best environment, the best place to thrive. And it's not that, you know, they will go and sit in that unexplored cavity, which is a small horn. But if at all it is formed there, well, it's like an ectopic. It has to be considered like an ectopic. It has to be uh, uh, terminated. So this was about uniconvoid uterus. Then uterus diadelphus with all its different ways of many, you know, manifestations, like with two cervix with a transverse vaginal septum sometimes because, you know, they, they have not the two mullerian, the paramesonephric ducts, the two mullerian ducts, they've not joined properly. Okay. So since they have not joined properly, there's a chance even the vagina and the cervix have not joined properly. So that is why you have two cervixes and usually you have a longitudinal septum with uterus diadelphus. And that makes you feel that there are two vaginas. The septum is also very different. It could be thick, muscular, and it could be thin like a, like a you know, a membrane. So it's one is very easy to uh, operate upon the membrane is the one thick septa that is a little difficult because it bleeds too much and it's got a you know a very notoriety of getting uh, uh, you know causing atresia or let's say uh, adhesions you know so that is the problem with it. Then comes biconvoid uterus. So biconvoid uterus in its various manifestations. Biconvoid uterus can has to be separated and differentiated from you know your arcuate uterus by what? By this indentation on the serosa that you find, you know, like this. So if it is that deep, if it is more than one centimeter deep, then it is then it is biconvoid uterus. Otherwise, if it's less than that, it's just some you know this arcuate uterus, just a little indent or almost no indent. Right, so you it looks like a septate uterus almost. See, serosal indentation has to be more than one centimeter. Only then it will be called as a biconvoid uterus, not a septate uterus. A septate uterus, how does it look? That I'm going to show you next. So this is how the bi biconvoid uterus looks. And now let's talk about the other page of ASRM classification. See, that's what I was trying telling you about. It has included almost everything which I have seen so far in my life about Mullerian abnormalities. So here you have septate uterus, which uh, yeah, kind of resembles your uh, uh, biconvoid uterus, except for the fact that the indentation over here is less than one centimeter. So which is almost negligible. You can't even see that. But the septate is there, septum is there. So partial, complete, arcuate uterus is coming under the same category. All right. And then you have this transverse vaginal septum, mid vaginal septum. It could be distal vaginal septum, right? 
then you come back to longitudinal vaginal aseptum vaginal septum in which it could be partial it could be complete it might not be obstructing it could be obstructing see this one is obstructing and this one is also obstructing you have two separate cavities over here some of them are not even you know kind of communicating properly so these are the various and then of course there is a separate category of complex epidermis so this is the best thing that any classification can do it always leaves scope of for those classification for those um, you know uh, abnormalities which at chance you find out which was not fitting into any of these categories okay 